Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with me as we struggle through what I hope will be the last few weeks of being separated from one another. I have the rather complex task of walking through what's been called perhaps the chapter of the Synoptic Gospels, which has been commented upon more in modern times than any other of chapter of the Synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, but I'm not complaining because I asked for this chapter. Um, as a teacher, I know the best way to incorporate the material into your head and heart is to teach it. So let's jump in. Now I'm going to warn you that I'm going to be using a word for word translation of this chapter, in part because using different translations will make some issues pop out for you when you're studying the word on your own, and partly because as I read it and then you follow along in your own text, you'll begin to understand how translators have really had to wrestle with putting the original Greek into another language let alone translating what Jesus is saying about what's going on in heaven and in the future. In, the, in this chapter, we see that Mark was a man grounded in Aramaic and not as, especially a fluent in Greek, as a matter of fact, but he is working hard to make what he is saying clear to a Greek speaking audience who's living in the West. We will also see that part of the reason why this chapter has been commented upon so much is that some of the sayings point very clearly to exactly when Mark wrote this gospel. And of course, that causes huge arguments among theologians. I'm going to give you a trigger warning. Uh, you are going to get a biased view here based on what I know about the world of the first century AD. Now, as Jesus is talking in this chapter, he's making great use of the texts from the Old Testament. Um, I suspect probably even more than theologians have given him credit for. These texts um, also talk about the end times. Um, now, Christians also talk about the end times as the second coming, because we understand it as a time when Jesus will come back to earth. That was not the view of the uh, Hebrew uh, Bible, because they didn't understand uh, what Jesus' mission was and how it would unfold. Um, so these, but these texts, even if they were only talking about the end times, were also unclear to the readers of the Hebrew scriptures. You just have to look at the visions in Daniel to see how much commentary those have built up. These types are familiar to you now, though, because you've read Revelation, which was written after Mark, but does talk about the end times and talks about in terms of the second coming of Jesus. Now, in this section in in this chapter in Mark, Jesus is speaking to only four of his disciples here. I, I love that the sons of thunder are right there, and also the brothers Peter and Andrew. Now he knows he's only days away from being put to death, but he's looking beyond this time and he's trying to prepare them and prepare us for what's going to happen between his resurrection and his second coming. They need to expect, excuse me, they need to expect that they are going to live lives full of danger, and they also need to anticipate his return, uh, but that will only come after a long struggle. Now, Mark has been writing in the past tense, but to drive home the importance of this message, he is going to switch into the present tense, and I'm going to start. And as he goes out of the temple, one of the disciples says to him, teacher, look, such stones, such buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? By no means shall there be a stone left upon a stone that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him in private, tell us, when will these things be? And when are all the things are about that are about to be completed, what will be the sign? We've already reached the crux of the problem of the saying here. James, John, Andrew, and Peter, and now remember, Peter is the person that Mark probably got his information from, are confusing things. Jesus, the creator God, remember, is being asked to marvel at a structure built by humans. Now, admittedly, it was impressive by human standards, 
but I'd be a little embarrassed to stack it up against, um, I don't know, the creation of the universe. But Jesus does look at it. And remember, too, that he had stood in this very spot hours before and had wept over the city of Jerusalem. But he stands here now with his four disciples, and he predicts that the temple will not remain standing. Our intrepid team is probably really shook by this. The building was, in fact, not quite finished, in fact. But they immediately equate the destruction of the temple with the end of days, an equation that was probably familiar to them from Jewish apocalyptic literature or Jewish literature about the end times. So when Jesus answers, he's going to talk about these two things as separate moments in Earth's history. But unfortunately for us, it's not always entirely clear when he is switching from one event um, to the other. But let's begin where Jesus begins, in the preparation for the end times, or when he comes back to the earth in glory as a judge. Talking about this encompasses verses 5 through 11. And notice how many times in this chapter the hearer is told, look, keep watch, be alert. And so I'm going to start with verse 5. And Jesus began saying to them, keep watch so that no one causes you to go astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will cause many to go astray. But when you hear about wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. It's necessary that this occur, but the end is not yet. For nation will be raised against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In places there will be earthquakes, there will be famines. These things are the beginnings of birth pangs. But you look to yourselves. They will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will be arraigned before rulers and kings for my sake, in order to testify against them. And it is necessary first that the good tidings be proclaimed to all the nations. And when, on delivering you over, they lead you in, do not worry beforehand about what you're saying. Rather, whatever is given to you. In that hour, say that, for you're not the one speaking, but rather the Spirit, the Holy One. So you'll notice that Jesus has yet to say anything about the first question, the destruction of the temple. But he begins with the period between his resurrection and the beginning of the end. And, and actually, he's going to come back to that at the end of the chapter. So he begins with the period between his resurrection and the beginning of the end, or as one of my Texan friends says, the beginnings of the fixin to commence. But there will be warning signs, Jesus tells us, of the beginnings of the fixin to commence, and we need to pay attention to them. But they are not signs that the end of human history is imminent. The first one will be false messiahs, or people wrongly saying that they're working in Jesus's name. We need to be as wise as serpents here as we learn to discern a false gospel and a false messiah, there will be many who will go astray, sadly. Next, we need to watch for man-made disasters, wars, and rumors of wars, but neither one of these is signs of an imminent second coming. They're simply the result of sinful man living on this earth. There will be natural disasters that happen also, earthquakes and famines, but these are necessary, and they are just indications that the earth will see the second coming. The important point here is that one thing is certain. Human history is moving towards a conclusion. Christ will return at that conclusion of human history. In the meantime, Jesus tells his disciples, there will be suffering for Christians, starting with the disciples themselves. Remember, Mark is writing for Christians who are being persecuted and for whom these words would have had a deep emotional impact. These words continue to bring strength and hope to persecuted Christians today. Jesus is saying that while they and we witness to the truth of the gospel of Jesus, those who witness will need to endure physical and emotional suffering. But the entire time, the disciples, we, all Christians, 
will have the support of the Holy Spirit to help us know what to say and how to face those circumstances. This is a strong comfort. But notice too that the disciples asked for one or a sign for the end of the age, and Jesus has yet to prepare it, to provide it. He's preparing them and us for the period between the resurrection and the end times. So in verses 12 through 23, he appears to move on to another topic, which we now call the first Jewish war and the destruction of the temple. Although there's no real break in the language, and I can understand why the disciples would have been confused at this point. So Jesus goes on to say, in, starting in verse 12, and brother will deliver up brother to death and father child and children will rise up, will rise up against parents and put them to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. But whoever endures to the end, that one will be saved. And when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Now, that was a comment inserted by Mark. It was not said by Jesus. So let the reader understand. Then those in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. He who is on the rooftop, let him neither descend nor go in to collect things from his household. And he who is in the field, let him not turn back to fetch his cloak. And alas, in those days for the pregnant woman and the woman nursing, and pray that it may not occur in the winter. For those days will be an affliction such as not occurred since the beginning of creation that God created until now, nor indeed could occur. And but that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh at all would have been saved. Yet because of the chosen whom he chose, he shortened the days. And if anyone says to you then, look, here's the anointed, look, there, do not believe. False anointed ones and false prophets will be raised up, and they will produce signs and prodigies so as to lead astray, if possible, the chosen. I am going to turn to a passage in Josephus's Jewish War. Um, to let you know how a non-Christian reported upon the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Josephus was a Pharisee who fought the Romans at the beginning of the first Jewish war. Now, this is going on in the late 60s AD. Um, and what happens is that the Jews are trying to militarily throw off um, the yoke of Rome. Now, uh, Josephus um, uh, in my book is a, a really awful man. He, he actually tricks his own officers and um, in, into, he, he actually kills them. He's swearing that he's going to commit suicide and then he doesn't. He turns himself over to the Romans and is taken prisoner and becomes an advisor uh, to uh, the, the general Titus who, who is pursuing the war. Um, after the war, he was brought to Rome with Titus, and he ended up writing a history of the Jews, as it's called, and the book called The Jewish War, um, before dying alone and friendless in Rome. Um, by the way, if you hear that Josephus wrote about, Jesus said, that's not true, that was a medieval forgery, so um, I'm just judging him on his, his real writings. But, I, but, I, but he did write about the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. So I'm going to talk, uh, um, read to you some passages which showed the fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy. And so beginning in his book five, um, paragraph 250 and farther, he says, the Jews inside the city were divided into two factions, one led by Simon and the old guard, the other John and the zealots. They occupied different areas of the fortified city, burning the area between them so it was a no man's land. They were, they were fighting that much. They couldn't even come together when the Romans were facing them. Now, certainly the citizens of Jerusalem suffered nothing worse at the hands of the Romans than what they inflicted upon each other. Admittedly, Josephus is with the Romans. He, and he, he keeps wanting to show the Romans as being merciful but there was clearly a great deal of infighting within the city itself. I maintain that it was a sedition 
far more, uh, which was far more stubborn than her wall, that is the wall that went around Jerusalem, and that all the tragedy of it may be properly ascribed to her own people on all justice to the Romans. As I said, he's on the Roman side, so don't worry about that last one. But it, this certainly fulfills the part that Jesus was talking about when there would be brother against brother, even while they were supposed to be fighting the Romans. Eventually, the two groups did come to an understanding, and they did hold the Romans off for a long time. But as you can imagine, even before the city of the siege of Jerusalem, the Jews were divided on how to proceed, with different groups taking different points of view. The Sadducees, for instance, wanted no part of this revolt. They had too much to lose. After the war, in fact, there were no Sadducees left. The Romans eventually made a counter wall around the city of Jerusalem so no one could get in and no one could get out. The result was terrible suffering for the, to the people in the city due to famine and thirst. Prisoners of the Romans were also executed by being crucified in the sight of their families. And Josephus says, so great was the number that the space could not be found for crosses nor enough crosses for their bodies. So much for the justice-loving Romans. Uh, because of Roman attacks on the Temple Mount, the temple and all the surrounding buildings were set on fire. And Josephus goes on, while the temple blazed, the victors plundered everything that fell in their way and slaughtered wholesale all who were caught. No pity was shown for age, no reverence for rank. Children and graybeards, laity and priests, all were massacred. Every class was pursued and encompassed in the grasp of war, whether suppliants for mercy or offering resistance. So you can see why Jesus thought the best solution for Christians at this point was to flee the city before the Romans came. And this part of the prophecy tells us that Jesus is not talking about the end times because you can't run away from the end times, but you could run away from the siege of Jerusalem. So Josephus goes on and by saying some of those who were killed owed their destruction to a false prophet who had on that day proclaimed to the people in the city that God had commanded them to go up to the temple court to receive there the tokens of their deliverance. Numerous prophets indeed were at this period used by the tyrants who ruled Jerusalem, that is Simon and John, he calls them tyrants at this point, who ruled Jerusalem to delude the people, bidding them to wait for help from God in order that desertions might be checked and that those who were above fear and precaution might be encouraged by hope. Now, sadly, Jesus foresaw that there would be false prophets and false messiahs who would lead people into more destruction and loss of life during the siege of Jerusalem. Josephus, in fact, goes on to talk about signs and wonders that these prophets and false messiahs did in order to prove that they had a link aligned to God's ears. Now, the part that makes you wonder if Jesus is talking about the end times here and not the destruction of the temple is his mention of the abomination of desolation. This phrase would have been familiar to the disciples because it was mentioned in one, one of the places it was mentioned was Daniel 9, verse 27, where the angel Gabriel is talking to Daniel um, in a vision that Daniel is having, saying that he was that he Gabriel was talking about the time between the rebuilding of the temple to the period when the Messiah would come. Now Gabriel tells Daniel that in this span of time, an unnamed ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And in a wing of the temple, he will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Now this part of the vision of Daniel's vision is, is and was commonly interpreted as having happened before Jesus was born under Antiochus IV, who is nicknamed Epiphanes or madman by the people who knew him. So Antiochus IV had in fact taken over the city of Jerusalem and it ordered the end of the sacrifices in the temple. 
so Jesus is reinterpreting the vision of Daniel as is totally appropriate because he knows exactly what Gabriel was talking about to say that the Romans will be doing the same thing, but they will be doing it permanently. Now, of course, the Romans do stop the sacrifices when they destroy the temple, but they also, as Josephus tells us, and I'm quoting here again, they carried their standards, standards are um, legionary flags that actually had the images of the emperor on them. So they're, they're bringing images of created beings into the temple, into the temple court, in fact. Now the buildings all around them and the temple itself are on fire, or at least smoldering. So they bring these things in and they set them up opposite the Eastern gate and there they sacrifice to them. Mark's aside here, let the reader understand, has caused an intense burst of writing by theologians since many think that Mark was writing just before the temple was destroyed. Uh, personally, I don't see why it could not have been written before the temple was destroyed. And then the author penned in a comment to remind his listeners that Jesus's prophecy had been fulfilled in 70, but I'm not a theologian. So there's a question um, in this part of the passage that still stumps commentators and still stumps me too. We're not sure who Jesus is talking about when he talks about the elect or the chosen being saved. Is this only Christians? Is this the elect godly Jews? Or is this Jewish followers of Jesus? You, you can find people on all sides. Whoever is being talked about here, the words must have been comforting to his readers, that is to Mark's readers, um, as they, as Jesus is assuring everyone that God is in control of all events, even during the persecution of the chosen. These same words bring comfort today to our own brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for their faith. God sees their suffering and has already planned a timetable to bring an end to it. So what is clear to Mark is that the destruction of the temple is because of God's judgment on the sacrificial system. God needs to destroy the temple in order to get the message out to the Jews and to the wider world that the Messiah did come and there's no longer any need for sacrifices. Jewish law is now seen for what it was, a measure that was put into place to help God's people remember the covenant that he had made with them, a covenant that would result in the coming of Messiah to earth. With the destruction of the temple, God's covenant is now, as he promised from the beginning, clearly moving out into the world beyond Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Instead of God's glory resting in one place, it now rests within every believer. Jesus' death puts an end to the need for the temple, but the disciples aren't thinking about it this way. They're trying not to think about the death of Jesus at all, in fact. They're only thinking about the destruction of the temple ushering in the end times. They're thinking about the end of the world when God is talking about the end of a world, the world of the temple-centered faith and problems with institutional Judaism that Jesus has been talking about since at least Mark 11. So after talking in some detail about the destruction of the temple, Jesus now turns to the separate part of the question that the, that the disciples asked, what will be the sign that the end times are upon us? And J Jesus uh, is in fact signaling that he's moving on to a new topic in the first phrase of what he goes on to say. He says, and in those days after that affliction. So let's hear how he answers the question about the sign that will show believers that the end times are upon us, starting in verse 24. As I said, a real, there's a real break here in terms of language. And in those days, after that affliction, that is the destruction of the temple, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send forth the angels, and they will gather together 
the chosen from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the sky. But learn the parable from the fig tree. Now, when its branch softens and produces leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, you know that he is near at the doors. Amen, I tell you, this generation most certainly does not pass away until all these things happen. The sky and the earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But as for the day and the hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father. Keep watch, be alert, for you do not know when that moment is, just as a man gone abroad, leaving his household and giving power to his slaves to each a task of his own, also commanded the doorkeeper that he should be vigilant. Be vigilant, therefore, for you do not know when the Lord of the household comes, whether at evening or midnight or cockcrow or in the morning, so that arriving suddenly he does not find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, be vigilant. I am going to tell you right off the bat that scholars are very undecided about a number of verses in this passage, especially verse 30, where Jesus says that this generation will not pass away before these things happen. If he's talking about the destruction of the temple, that would be very understandable, which did happen about 40 years after he was speaking to the disciples. But the phrase comes right in the middle of the sentences and the language that is drawn directly from the visions of end times. And you're probably familiar with them through the, the writings of John in Revelation. In that vision, John also describes the darkening of the sun, the stars falling from the sky, the elect being gathered by the angels, and not a single person of this elect will be overlooked. All of creation participates in the second coming, which will be remade completely in honor of Jesus's sacrificial offering of himself to turn away God's wrath. Does Jesus answer the question about when will we know it's coming? Well, yes, he does, but in a way that you might not be ready for. He says he doesn't even know when it's coming. Uh, to me, this answer is wonderful. It makes entirely clear that Jesus was what he said he was, fully God and fully human. Although Jesus said these things and, and pointed this out, it still took Christians hundreds of years to work it out, which is what they finally did in the late fifth century Chalcedonian Creed, which asserts that Jesus was perfect in his Godhead, perfect in his manhood, fully God, fully man, with neither his divinity nor his humanity taken away by this union in one person, but the property of each nature being fully preserved. We've already seen this in the Gospels, as Tim Keller pointed out. Jesus could get hungry, even if he could divide loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 people. 5,000 men, anyway, probably more people. He had birthdays, but he was also the Alpha and Omega, the creator and the person who ends creation. While he was on earth, he voluntarily emptied himself of his divine powers in order to fully know what it was like to be human. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be tired. He knew what it was like to die. Now, Jesus is fully divine, but he has chosen to be patient and wait for the word from the Father about the exact timing of his second coming. I, I just love this verse. It shows to me that Mark was writing down what he had heard from Peter and Holy Spirit. I mean, if you were making up this Messiah, would you have him admit that he doesn't know that about when he's coming back? I doubt it, but this is a true record of what Jesus said. And it tells us that we have to work to understand him, not to make up a Messiah that conforms to what we think a Messiah should be. Jesus actually tells us to both use our common sense and also to stay watchful. The fig tree parable is about watching the world and its natural cycle. 
And again, some scholars think this parable belongs in the section about the destruction of the temple. And others just kind of throw up their hands and say, no, it's a general sign. But more clearly, Jesus says in his last illustration, be alert, like the night watchman. Keep at your appointed tasks. That is, he will come back, but we have to be ready for when, as it could come at any time. As C.S. Lewis says in The World's Last Night, live in the light of the second coming happening at any minute. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're doing. Think about what your priorities are. The second coming is a reason why you should act the way you do or the way you're expected to act. Be vigilant. Now, there's nothing wrong with some R and R. Do you look forward to sitting down at the end of a long and exhausting day and switching on the TV? I do. I certainly do. There's nothing wrong with that, unless it's the only thing that you're looking forward to. Jesus promises us that pain and suffering won't last forever. The good old days are actually in the future, and he will come back. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this talk that you gave to the disciples and all the generations of the Christians who came afterwards. We hear your words that you have foreseen the pain and the suffering that have happened, that is happening, and that will happen to Christians. And we take comfort in knowing that you know them all and that you will cut short the time of this suffering for our sake. We, like your disciples, really want to know when you will come again and remake creation, putting all things right. Help us to understand that the timing of your return is from the Father, but help us also to rest in the understanding that you will come again. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be vigilant and to be at our tasks while we wait. Help us to use the time to show unbelievers why we have such a hope. Maranatha, Lord Jesus.